anime is a long-running and multifaceted genre that has originated many masterpieces over the years. Some of them turned out to be so topical and original that they did not leave indifferent not only critics and spectators, but also Hollywood directors. Filmmakers quite often take inspiration from anime when making their films. This is About Movies, and today we're going to talk about why the best directors of our time, from Guillermo del Toro to Christopher Nolan, borrow plots and ideas from anime and even reshoot scenes from their favorite anime frames. Is it a tribute of love or banal theft? Is it the absence of new ideas or just a coincidence? Watch this before you hit the subscribe button and bell to know the cinema better than many other fans. Subscribe and let's get started. It should be understood that Hollywood has been sinful for a long time. It stole from Japanese artists even before American viewers got acquainted with anime. Back in 1964, director Sergio Leone received a letter from Akira Kurosawa saying, I have seen your film, it's a very good film, but unfortunately, it's mine. We are talking about A Fistful of Dollars in 1964, which completely copies the Japanese film Yojimbo, The Bodyguard, in 1961. Not only the plot was copied, but also many scenes frame by frame. In the end, all this turned into a lawsuit that Kurosawa won receiving $100,000 in one-time compensations and 15% of the entire box office receipts of the Sergio Leone film. This case has become a very significant example for the whole of Hollywood. The world was becoming more and more globalized every day, and it was no longer possible to take Japanese ideas openly. But the process of borrowing and imitation in art is inevitable. Therefore, with the advent of anime on the American market, directors began to actively, although not so brazenly, use ideas from masterpieces of Japanese animation. Taking for example the iconic Matrix by the Wachowski sisters. Immediately after their release, people found not only a conceptual similarity with the equally iconic Ghost in the Shell, but also a constant borrowing of visual solutions. The Wachowskis didn't hide the fact that they were inspired by this anime when creating their film. For example, one of the most obvious details is an endless stream of green numbers, which is associated precisely with the Matrix, but in fact, they have been used before in anime. Ghost in the Shell is not just a classic of anime, but of culture and contemporary art in general. Ideas of artificial bodies, cybernation, network, and people in the society of the near future, although not original to Ghost in the Shell, it was here that they were presented in one of the best ways, wrapped in probably the best packaging and format. Therefore, it's not surprising that themes and ideas that are raised in this anime have migrated to other films, and this is not only about The Matrix. Other Hollywood influences from this anime include Dollhouse, Steven Spielberg's AI, James Cameron's Avatar, and even The Surrogates. And now, an interesting observation. The Matrix came out in 1999. Let's rewind 31 years ago before these events and trace the entire chain of inspired authors. We are now in 1968. Philip Kindred Dick is releasing his novel Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? In fact, it became the forerunner of all cyberpunk novels, but at the same time, the mid-80s are considered the birth years of this genre. It took more than 10 years for these ideas to mature like fine wine. In 1982, Ridley Scott released the film Blade Runner based on this book. The film earned a lot of the box office but consolidated its cult status on video cassettes. These video cassettes ended up in Japan, and seven years later in 1989, Masamune Shiro, inspired by Blade Runner, released his Ghost in the Shell manga. And two years later, The Matrix inspired by him comes out. In addition, Blade Runner is inspired not only by Shiro, but also by Hideo Kojima, who has just started his career as a game designer. And in 1988, he released The Snatcher Game, which almost verbatim copied the Ridley Scott film. Ghost in the Shell basically copied the visual dystopian landscapes and general aesthetics, but Snatcher just looked like a copy and paste. And here we have only four years before The Matrix's release. A journey of 31 years was marked by the release of one of the best science fiction films, which in turn asks the question of all mankind. What is reality? How can we be sure that we exist? So, what do we want to say to all of this? Sometimes, rather complex ideas expressed by predecessors should settle in the minds of some people who will be able to understand for themselves what the author was talking about. 
to isolate from all the ideas that are closest to them. After that, having passed all this through the prism of one's own consciousness to issue a different work. This is how Blade Runner inspired the author of Ghost in the Shell, who in turn inspired the Wachowskis. And at first glance, Philip K. Dick's complex idea is, We are living in a computer programmed reality, and the only clue we have to it is when some variable is changed and some alteration in our reality occurs. 1977 put into the minds of readers, roamed the minds of people for 31 years, until it was simplified to the level of robots have enslaved us, let's defeat them. Only then did people understand what Philip Dick was trying to tell them. True, his idea has acquired an extremely bizarre form. The topic of artificial intelligence has worried people for more than a dozen years. Another example of the striking similarity of the film and anime on this subject is Spike Lee's Her and Showbits. While the aesthetic and emotional differences between them are huge, the ideas are similar. In Showbits, the hero acquires an android girl and gradually falls in love with her. Furthermore, Theodore and Amy's conversations about dealing with machines in Her are not far removed from Hideki's conversations with other anime characters like Hiroyasu, who fell in love with an amnesiac android or a teacher whose husband kicked her out to live with an android. The society's view of such relationships is one of the main themes in both the anime and the film. However, Spike has never said that he took inspiration from Shobits or many other robot-themed anime. Why exactly did anime succeed in such ideas that Hollywood directors then adopted them? You all know that Japan has been isolated from the whole world for a long time. The Japanese simply didn't let foreigners in, and so it went on for many centuries. This alienation led their culture to an exceptional path of development. That is, for years, their minds and national characteristics weren't influenced in any way from the outside. This cultural soup persisted until the nuclear bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, after which the country capitulated to the United States. Furthermore, Japan began to look for its place in the new, bipolar world and gradually succumbed to the influence of world popular culture. They absorbed tons of everything new and passed the information received through their own mentality, unlike anything else. Then, of course, it began. Manga, anime, cinema, and literature. That is, the Japanese view of the world around them conveyed through creativity began to influence European culture. And so, around the mid-80s, a new wave of mainstream American directors stumbled upon anime and a whole bunch of films by Japanese authors. Cameron takes all the visuals that aren't nailed to the floor and integrates them into his films. Tarantino literally sews all his films from scraps of other people's work, and the title theme, Kill Bill, is the title theme of the Japanese film Battle Without Honor and Dignity in 1974. Nolan, after watching the anime Paprika, was inspired and wrote the script for the film Inception. Paprika and Inception are similar not only in the idea of controlling dreams, but also in specific shots when the hero of Joseph Gordon-Levitt runs along the walls of a rotating corridor. Detective Konakawa runs down a similar corridor at the beginning of Paprika. Or when at the end of Elliot Page's heroine that seemed like an unrealistic urban landscape crumbles with fragments, Paprika sees about the same in front of her. However, you need to understand that this is not a one-sided borrowing of ideas, but an exchange. Paprika, in turn, refers to classic Hollywood films of the 20th century, including Tarzan and Roman Holiday. But most of all, the distinguished director himself, Darren Aronofsky, who in two of his directorial works was inspired by Perfect Blue by Satoshi Kon and in Requiem for a Dream, he simply copies one scene in the bathroom. Then, his black swan, in terms of plot, almost halfly is perfect blue. The anime tells about the pop diva Mamarin Kirigo, who decided to become an actress. The reality in this film is presented through the prism of the inflamed consciousness of the main character, who suffers from a split personality and hallucinations. Her life cracks, and at some point she realizes that she no longer controls anything in her. Roughly, the same thing happens with the heroines of the two main films of Arnofsky. But don't accuse Arnofsky of plagiarism yet. He bought the ideas from Khan himself just to avoid problems, and after the release of Black Swan, he honestly admitted the plot similarity of his film to the anime.
Well, now let's talk about something newer. Many people know the examples with the Matrix in the beginning, but what about the borrowings of the Duffer brothers, the directors of Stranger Things? The brothers stated their plot of their series is heavily inspired by Akira. From the most obvious, in this anime there are children with psychic abilities who were guinea pigs in a government project. Similarly, Eleven's powers are used by the Department of Energy. But that's not all. Immediately after the release of the very first trailer of this series, some people noticed the similarity of the plot with the anime Elf and Lied. This discovery shocked the brothers as they were sure that no one but them had seen this anime. When I watched it, I thought it felt like an ultra-violent E.T. There were a lot of things in there that I really liked and that made their way into the show, particularly related to the character of Eleven, Matt Duffer. By the way, Elf and Lied in turn was clearly inspired by Akira, so as you can see, the cycle of borrowing is inevitable. The Duffer brothers are generally avid geeks, so it's not surprising that among the numerous references to pop culture, anime also wormed its way in. By the way, do you have any favorite anime? Share the names in the comments, we are very interested to know. There are directors who deny the similarity of their films with anime. Pacific Rim by Guillermo del Toro is not a direct remake of any particular manga or anime, but many associate its plot with the iconic Evangelion. The truth is that Guillermo del Toro's film is literally saturated with Japanese comic book culture. Firstly, it was created in the mecha genre, that is, it's about human-controlled combat robots. Secondly, these robots are designed to fight with certain kaiju, the Japanese word for strange beast, simply monster. And thirdly, Guillermo del Toro has never hidden that he is a big fan of tokusatsu, a Japanese film genre, something like a fantasy film with special effects and about superheroes. So it's possible to characterize Pacific Rim. At the same time, both del Toro and screenwriter Travis Beecham denied that they watched Evangelion but referred to Gigantor and Mobile Police Pat Labor. Then why do many fans believe that the ideas come from Evangelion? The fact is that the intersection of cultures and ideas, even among authors who live in different parts of the world, is inevitable and natural. And to call plagiarism all the borrowings that we talked about today is stupid. After all, it's not in vain that they say that everything new is a well-forgotten old. Some brilliant stories give rise to others, no less brilliant. The main thing is that the result of such a cycle of ideas inspired viewers and authors satisfied with the fact that they were able to convey their vision of the world to people. For example, The Wachowski Matrix has become one of the seminal films of our time. Fans are still pondering the ideas raised in the trilogy and coming up with new theories. Some of them seem crazy, but the arguments in their favor are quite convincing. If you click on this icon that appears on your screen, you can learn about a theory that completely changes your idea of the Matrix. Follow the link and watch. You have watched About Movies. Like this video and be sure to come back. There are many more amazing facts about the world of cinema ahead. Bye-bye.